There you are. I thought you had disappeared. And I was going to preach alone, but you're still here, which is awesome. Good morning to you. Merry Christmas. We're so glad you've come out this morning. And before we start, let's pray and ask God to minister to our hearts and that we would open our hearts to Jesus. There'd be no sign that says no vacancy, but we'd say we want to hear from Christ. Lord, we do want to hear from you. And we open our hearts to you, Lord. And we want to make room for you. And in the busyness of this season and the stress of it and all that's happening, Lord, help us not to forget you and to put you at the very center of our lives and the very center of our families and the very center of this season. We thank you, Lord, for all you're doing. Thank you for this wonderful presentation of the gospel given to us by uh, these kids. Thank you, Lord, for each one. Bless them. Pray these things in your name. Amen. When my firstborn son was two weeks old, I had a brilliant idea. Back then, I thought that Matthew, our firstborn, would conform to our schedule. <laughs> and that somehow we would train him so that we could go on and live our lives like he never, I guess, existed in a sense. We had waited five years before we had our first one, so we had our ways of life, and, and how wrong I was. I was so wrong, but he was two weeks old, and I said, let's go on vacation. And uh, we had planned this vacation, and I said, we're going to go no matter what. That was a dumb idea, by the way. And we were living in Chicago at the time, in northwest suburbs of Chicago, Schaumburg, Hoffman Estates, and we decided, or I decided, and I overruled my wife's wisdom, which was another dumb thing I did. <laughs> and I said, we're going to go, because I wanted to see Lake Michigan, on the Michigan side, Lake Michigan, because it's beautiful on that side. They got sandy beaches, and it's just a wonderful place to be. And I said to Kitty, I said, we're going to go down and we packed my Vega, I think. That's another dumb idea. <laughs> and so we packed up our Vega and little Matt was in the back and I'm in the front and we're headed out and we're going to go to Michigan and find a cabin on Lake Michigan or a hotel or a motel. And this was before the days of cell phones and internet. You couldn't make reservations. I don't know how we lived. How did you make reservations back then? I don't know. We didn't know where we were going, but I, that's sort of how we operated back in those days. And so uh, we headed out and went down 294 around, and traffic is horrible. It's even worse today, I think. But, um, and we, it was getting late in the day. And uh, I thought, well, we'll just stop and we'll find this cabin on Lake Michigan and it'll be an awesome time and Matt will be perfect and, you know, everything's going to work out fine. Well, we started off and we hit sign after sign that said, no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy. And I'm thinking, Tom, this is really dumb. What are you doing out here with a two-week-old baby, and we can't find a place to stay. And so we went from, and it's a big tourist area, and it's peak season for tourism. Not a dumb idea. But uh, we uh, continued on, and I'm thinking, what, it's like we're homeless. We, we don't know where, where we got to find a place for the evening for Matt. And uh, sign after sign, little city after, their little cities are all along the lake there. And they kept saying no vacancy. And finally, we found one that says a vacancy. And she said, yeah, we got a cabin in the back. And so we drove down there, and it was late at night, and, and uh, had a nice little time. And I thought we would make supper, and they had a little stove oven in there. And I turned on the gas. And nothing happened. And then I said, well, let's light the oven. Another dumb idea. 
And, uh, so I lit that, boom! And it just went, whew. And uh, anyway, we survived that. Next day, we went home and everything was fine. You know, was, <laughs> that was the end of that. Uh, so, those of you who are new parents, don't do what we did. Uh, but uh, anyway, Mary and Joseph faced the same thing, but it was even worse. Mary was pregnant. Joseph was with her, and they were in Bethlehem, and there was a no vacancy sign on the only inn in town. There's no room in the inn. I wonder if Joseph felt like me. What is going on here? How could I do this? But to find out what led up to this, how did they get to this position? Let's turn to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And we'll find out how they got to where they were. Mary's ready to have this baby. And there is no room. In the end, there's a no vacancy sign. If you'll pull out your Bibles in the pews, you can follow right along with me. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree, Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. That's what we're going to try to cover in just a few minutes here. Issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Caesar Augustus is in power. He's the greatest emperor of the Roman world, Roman history. He reigned for 58 years. He's the one who brought peace to Rome, economic growth, lots of money, lots of buildings, lots of conquering he did uh, he was a pretty amazing emperor and uh, every 14 years he would take a census and the census was for who to find out who was in the military and taxation to tax the people so they had to know who what what property you owned and all that and so you had to go register every 14 years to update his records and in Israel, they did it differently than the rest of the world. They had people go back to their origin and where, they, uh, where their family was from. And this probably was only done in Israel. The rest of the Roman world, they stayed where they were at. And so it would be interesting to find out where you would go if uh, you had to go back 10 generations, five, six, seven, eight generations, where would you go? It'd be interesting to talk about that, uh, but that's the way they did it. For Kitty and I, we'd have to go to New Jersey, that's where the Neviuses came from, eventually go to Holland if they would take us back. But uh, that's where we came from, and so uh, that's, Mary, Joseph came from Bethlehem, and so he had to go back to Bethlehem to register. Now, it was interesting, this morning I was reading in my devotions, Micah chapter 5, uh, and Micah predicted and prophesied that a ruler would come out of Bethlehem, one who was eternal. And so the prophecy was set by Micah, and he predicted that out of Bethlehem, this little town that we saw while we were in Israel, this beautiful little city, and I'll never forget seeing where the shepherds were and where the manger was, and you look out and there's Jerusalem, and it's still there today. And so that's where they headed off. And pick up the, the story here in verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea. That's where Mary and Joseph lived. And that's where Mary, as Pastor Jeremy uh, preached last week, Mary uh, met the angel. The angel said, and we heard the story here with the kids. The angel said, you're going to be with child. The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. 
and you will conceive the Son of God, and you will have God himself living in you as baby Jesus. And then, of course, the angel appeared to Joseph, told him that to take his wife, Mary as his wife, that what's within her is from God. He's to name Jesus, and he is to be the one who will forgive Israel of their sins. So that's all happened. And so, verse 4, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. And that, of course, will preserve the prophecy given to David that someone would sit on his throne forever and ever because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, and so he took Mary with him. He didn't have to. It's all conjecture of why he took his pregnant wife with him. She was uh, in her ninth month of pregnancy, ready to give birth to a son, and uh, he had to go 90 miles. I looked up on the map where 90 miles would be, and that would be Nebraska City. So that would be like if you had to walk to Nebraska City with your wife who is pregnant. And she probably took a donkey, but that's a, that's a long way. It would be a long walk for any of us. Probably took four or five days. And so they made their way down to Bethlehem. While, verse 6, while they were there, we don't know how long time they were there. It might have been a few days, might have been a week. Uh, at some point, she said, it's time. Anybody remember those days when your wife said, or the, the mother of your children, it's time. I certainly can remember that. It happened four times. It's time. It's time. It's time to have the baby. Even though Luke faked us out, our fourth son, we thought we knew what we were doing, and we didn't. We went. <laughs> there was false labor involved in that, and we went back and drove around and tried bumps and whatever else. <laughs> That's a dumb idea. <laughs> but... Uh, we, uh, Luke, we thought, man, we should surely know what, what's happening, but it wasn't time when, he, when we thought it was. But Mary said it's time to have this baby. And so while they were, were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, which was the traditional way of what you did with your newborns and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There wasn't a place for them. And so what probably happened was that the innkeeper might have said, you know, I got a barn that's not being used, a stable, and you can go there and have your baby. It might have been the best he could have done because there was no room for that baby to be born where it could have been more safe and more secure and uh, warmer and those kinds of things. And so Jesus was born in a stable of some kind, a barn, maybe a cave, uh, and uh, he came to life in that cave. You know... This phrase, because there was no room for them in the inn, in my mind was a foreshadowing of what Christ would go through. He would be rejected. He would not be received. John 1, 11 says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. He came to the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And so there wasn't room for Jesus in people's lives. He was rejected. No room. No vacancy. 
Don't come into my life. Don't come into my world. You stay outside. You stay outside in the cold. You stay out. You just go to the barn and you can be there. But you will not come into my life. There's no room for you in my life. You see, my life is full. I'm full of myself. I'm full of this. I'm full of materialism. I'm full of pride. I'm full of arrogance. I'm full of unforgiveness. I'm full of something. And there's not any place in my life for you. And we are no better than that innkeeper who said, no, no place, no room. You know, Jesus made an astounding invitation in Revelation 3, verse 20. And he's writing to the church at Laodicea. This church, these are Christians. And he says to these believers, he says, here I am. Here is Jesus. Here is God himself. Here's the king of kings. Here's the creator of everything. And he humbles himself and he says this. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. Christ is standing at our doors and he's knocking on them even today. He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus is saying, I want into your life. But you have to decide what you want to do. Do you want to let me in? Do you want to receive me? Do you want to make room in your life for me? Do you want to come in? Do you want to let me in? I'm out here. I'm knocking on your door. I knock day and night. I, you never listen to me. I knock when it's cold, I knock when it's hot, I'm out here in the elements, I'm out here, and I love you, and I want into your life, into your very existence, into the very core of your being, I'm knocking. What kind of sign do you have outside your life? Is it flashing no vacancy? Or is it saying, come in, come into my life. I need you. I need you so badly. I've tried everything else. I've filled my life. I've filled it with all kinds of things, all kinds of pleasures. And it does not satisfy. It doesn't do anything for me. Possessions, I've tried that. I've made money, and that doesn't work. I've had any pleasure I've wanted, and that doesn't work. I've tried this philosophy, and that doesn't work. This health, self-help guru, that doesn't work. Nothing works except Jesus. Open up the doors of your life. It's time today to do that. What keeps you back? What keeps those doors shut? Why are they frozen? Why do you have a no vacancy sign out in front of your life? It's getting you nowhere, my friend. Nowhere fast. Today, if you hear his voice, if you are listening, you will hear his voice. And he's saying, I want to come in. I want to come in. I want to come into your life. There's three things that have to happen to let him into your life. First of all, there has to be repentance. Your life is full of stuff that doesn't work. Your life is full of things that are ruining your life. Repentance is simply turning away from them with the help of God. And God will help you. You say, Lord, I don't want to do these things anymore. They're absolutely terrible in my life. They're ruining my life. I can't live this way anymore. I need a change. 
And today you can have that change. And the second step is receive. Receive Christ. Open up the door. Say, yes, I want him. Yes, I need him. Yes, I desire him. And then the last one is another R. Rest in him. Just rest in Christ. Rest in his righteousness. Rest in his forgiveness. Rest in his sovereign control. Rest in his power. Rest in his peace. Rest in his love and his desire. Rest in his mercy. Just rest in Christ. May your soul find rest today. Let's pray. Jesus is knocking. I know that. I know that. He's here. He walks amongst us. He's knocking on our door. He's saying, let me in. Would you do that today? Do you let Jesus into your life? Why have you kept him outside for so long? He wants in. Father, the front door is open in this church for you. I say, come, Lord Jesus. Come into our midst. You're welcome. Come into individual lives. Come and save us. Come and give us rest from our burdens and those things that we're stressed out about. Come and bring love. Come and bring a new heart. Come and bring your Holy Spirit. Come and give us this gift of salvation. Come and sanctify us. Come and heal us. Come and give us hope. Give us joy. Give us peace. Come, Lord Jesus. You are welcome here. I pray that many of us would pray that to you today. We thank you for this time together. We ask your blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. <laughs> Fathers, we leave. May we leave in your grace and peace and mercy. Thank you for allowing us to be together today. We know each Sunday we gather is one Sunday closer to being with you forever and ever. Keep us faithful till that day. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas. Say Merry Christmas someone. Greet somebody. Go visit with your kids. Those kids did great.